You're watching Tag TV. Welcome back. Welcome back from the break. Um, our next session um, is the need for the hour for uh, presence for the future of a strong Hindu American civic presence, and uh, that's public service and advocacy. Um, the topic, the name of the topic of the session is Ancient Wisdom, Modern Applications, the Emergence of Hindu Americans in the Public Square. And um, I invite the uh, uh, moderator for the session, Suhak Shukla. She is a few words about her. She is the executive director and co-founder of the Hindu American Foundation. That's headquartered uh, in Capitol Hill in DC, it was founded in 2003. And she has helped steer the foundation to being recognized as a leading voice for civil rights, human rights, and religious freedom. So I'll let her take it away. Thank you. Namaste. Um, I, I think some of the panelists may still be outside. I'll invite, if you know you're on this panel, I invite you to please join us on stage. So for the next uh, 75 minutes or so, we'll be talking about two things that they say should not be discussed in polite company, and that's religion and politics. Uh, but um, this is all uh, a conversation that's geared towards the force for good that uh, dharma um, can play in the public square. Today, I'm joined by an esteemed panel uh, and uh, so I'll just very quickly introduce them. Their bios are available in your souvenir booklet, and they will be <clears throat> on the slide as well. But today we're joined by State Senator Jamie Eldridge, a member of the Massachusetts State Senate, where he represents Middlesex and Worcester, I got it right, I think, district since November 4th, 2008. We have Ohio State Representative Neera Jantani, who serves Ohio's 42nd district. We have Michigan State yeah. Representative Padma Kupa, who serves Michigan's 41st House District. We have HAF's former uh, Director of Government Relations uh, here from Washington, D.C., Jay Kansara. And we also have Attorney Vindya Adipa, who serves as the Assistant General Counsel at Hebrew Immigrant Aid Services, or HIAS, the world's oldest refugee resettlement agency. I'd like to first invite State Senator Eldridge to give us some opening remarks. So good morning. And I want to thank uh, Priya Samant for inviting me uh, to speak to the Threads Conference and really honored to serve on this panel. Uh, my name is Jamie Eldridge. I'm state senator for 14 communities in the metro west part of Massachusetts. And the district I represent, about 170,000 people, has probably one of the highest populations of uh, South Asian Americans um, in Massachusetts. And so as a result, um, really developed a close relationship, including with the Indian American community, um, going to many different cultural events. Um, I'll be going to the Diwali celebration in my district next weekend, and had the pleasure to have a number of, of interns and interact with activists and really try to best understand um, the contributions of the Indian American, Hindu American uh, contributions to Massachusetts and, and to America. And I, I know that the reading through the discussion around the Threads 2019 conference, it says that the purpose aims to bring together Hindu American thinkers, artists, educators, writers, public policy makers, scientists, medical professionals, technologists, entrepreneurs, business leaders on one platform for a singular purpose, to share their stories and journeys, to celebrate their accomplishments and engage with each other face to face, explore and share ideas for brighter, better America of tomorrow. So what, what I would say just from my observations from interactions, and it, it, it sort of was sparked this week uh, on Wednesday when I was taking the train into Boston to the State House where, where I work most days, is that I, I happened to, to sit next to an Indian American gentleman who 
uh, introduce himself and actually, uh, coincidentally, uh, both of his daughters had interned for me many, many years ago in, in my uh, district office. And just in having that conversation, uh, taking the train into Boston, in, in some ways it sort of it mirrored what one of my observations about the, the Hindu American or Indian American experience is that he had arrived in 1980, um, had gone right into high tech and clearly had sort of sacrificed anything else he wanted to do aside from provide for his family and for, for his children um, so that his children could have a better life. His children uh, both went to very good universities and um, both of them initially thought that they would go into the, to the private sector, but um, in part through a number of experiences growing up in America, they both ended up, um, one ended up working for the Obama uh, campaign and another one uh, ended up working for a nonprofit um, to help and serve refugees. And I, and I think it's one of the, to me, very encouraging changes that I, I am seeing is, is really an increasing activism uh, amongst young Indian Americans. And just a, a quick example is in, in my district, and I was very proud to, to know her when she was in college, uh, as a young woman, Varshini Prakash. And I don't know if her, her name resonates with anyone here, but she is one of just two co-founders of the Sunrise Movement. So this is the national Sunrise Movement of young, young people that are leading the effort uh, for the United States of America to get back to taking leadership on climate change uh, she and many other young people actually uh, were in, in uh, then uh, Minority Leader Pelosi's office doing a sit-in protest. Uh, of course, now uh, Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House. This is before the change in election. Um, but that protest really sort of spearheaded a signal uh, that young people really were demanding action from their elected officials to take action on, on climate change. And so this is someone that um, you know, Varshini, second generation Indian American, grew up, uh, was born here in America, and um, she was already taking national leadership um, beyond sort of her own community, if you will, beyond the Indian community, um, but really taking national leadership. And she is now traveling the country um, working on, on climate change. So I, I think in some ways that's an example of, what, of what's changed. And, and in terms of how do we expand that, how do we encourage that, um, I've been very pleased to be part of a number of organizations that are really looking to change that dynamic. Um, in Massachusetts, about 10 years ago, a number of Asian American leaders created the Asian American Women's Political Initiative, recognizing that um, beyond the fact that to some extent back then, there were not many uh, Asian Americans participating in politics, but particularly there were barriers for Asian American women. And so what that program has done is provided um, interns, Asian American female college students who are interning for different elected officials each and every year. Um, so I was very pleased to each year have an intern um, that cu a couple of the, the years uh, was an Indian American woman um, getting involved in politics, learning the process. So I think that's an encouraging step. The thing that I say to all of my interns, really all of my staff is, you know, when are you going to take that uh, next step to, to run for office. I, and I, I know one of the fellow panelists is, is an elected official, which is wonderful to see. Um, what we have here in Massachusetts, I, I think you're going to see that next wave right now of, of Indian Americans running for public office. I would say generally in Massachusetts, um, that hasn't happened too often. Um, but uh, there is a, a woman uh, named Dimple Rana who is running for Revere City Council. It's a city near Boston. And she is running for city council uh, this year. So I, I, I think you're seeing that, that change. Um, I, I would say generally in terms of my greatest interaction with the Indian American community in my district tends to be focused on cultural celebrations. And um, those are wonderful to see. And I'm deeply appreciative of the contributions that the South Asian, the Indian American, the Hindu American communities have given back in you know, areas such as academia and high tech, uh, medicine, um, and, and so many other of the industries that really make Massachusetts such a strong, uh, vibrant commonwealth and have such a strong, vibrant economy. But um, as an elected official, it's been wonderful to see 
more Indian Americans get involved, um, you know, looking to run for office, serving at the State House, um, and that's very encouraging to see. And so um, certainly those who, who came in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, you know, seeing their, their children, their grandchildren uh, get involved in public service is truly inspiring. I, what, what I would say generally is that I think there does need to be a stronger network to encourage uh, young Indian Americans, or really Indian Americans of any age, to, to get involved into the political sphere, to run for political office. Um, we're, I'm beginning to see you know, some signs of that, but I would see generally that network is not as strong as other immigrant communities uh, where I've seen uh, people run for office more, more frequently. So those are my observations. Um, I'm really honored to be invited here to speak. It's wonderful that this conference and this council is here in Massachusetts. I know there's many people from all over the country and all over the world here. So look forward to the chance to getting to know to you, and I'll be serving on the panel as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Eldridge. A little height difference here. Um, so political philosophy, statecraft, and diplomacy have a long tradition in Hindu civilization. Wisdom on nearly every aspect of these has been expounded upon in numerous sacred texts, from the Ramayan to Mahabharat, the Gita, and of course, Kautilya's seminal work, Arthashastra. So what have Hindu Americans naturally internalized from these and other dharma-based values and approaches? What more can Hindu Americans learn from our ancient wisdom for application in the modern world? The answers to these are key to understanding the importance of the emergence of Hindu Americans in the public square. Hindu Americans are represented at nearly every level of government, albeit still in very small numbers, as the senator pointed out. Hindu Americans made history in 2013 when the first Hindu was elected to the U.S. Congress. Since then, more than three self-identifying Hindu Americans have joined and several more have run. In the previous decade, several Hindu Americans broke barriers at the local and state levels of government, two of them who are with us today. And a number have enjoyed prestigious government appointments at all levels. And today, a Hindu American is running for president. What most of these politicians share is a widespread respect for the spirit of inquiry, intellectual rigor, and pragmatism that they bring to policymaking. Hindu Americans have also become increasingly active in the public sector and in advocacy in the hopes of not only addressing the well-being of Hindus, but seeking solutions rooted in Hindu philosophy to address domestic and global concerns facing humanity. They too are respected for the spirit of inquiry, intellectual rigor, and pragmatism that they bring to public service. The future of a strong Hindu American civic presence depends on political representation and participation, advocacy and public service. I'm joined today by an esteemed panel of public servants who will share their experiences and aspirations in these critical arenas. We'll talk about the mechanisms needed to expand the role, visibility, and influence of Hindu Americans in these spheres, while cultivating skills and opportunities at the grassroots level. We'll discuss how to effectively train, mentor, and develop support systems and networks for young Hindu Americans to enter and succeed in the public square. And lastly, will touch upon the positive value Hindu approaches bring to the proverbial table, approaches which are driven by a spirit of inquiry and sustained by values of non-harming, truth, moderation, and universal well-being, as well as a comfort with differences and a plurality of ideas and opinions, all in 45 minutes. What we don't get to in our moderated discussion, we hope that the audience will be submitting questions. So with that, I will turn to our panelists, and I'll start with Representative Neeraj Antani from Ohio. You know, you made history as uh, running for office at the age of 23, I believe, is when you entered, so a very young age. Um, I have a two-part question for you. Um, 
one, you know, what inspired you to run? Was it something in your upbringing? And I guess the second question was, what was your parents' reaction? <laughs> well, you know, thank you, Sue Hogg, and, and let me thank Dr. Bunsell and Dr. Astana and, and Sanjay and everyone at VHPA for, for having me. Um, you know, I would say, you know, as far as upbringing, I think that in Indian upbringing uh, is, you know, led me to office. I think that, you know, the dedication and, and hard work that is uh, instilled in, in us, uh, you know, as children, uh, you know, led to success and, and success in all sectors, right? I mean, we see that, you know, in whatever industry. And so that's not necessarily what led to political success, but uh, for me in, in politics uh, as, you know, my chosen uh, field. You know, as far as being a Hindu and, and thinking about Sue, I could send, you know, a note out, you know, before the panel. Um, you know, other religions are really about sort of, you know, doctrinal obedience, right? So, you know, I think that the, the best example is that, you know, Christians in Christmas, you know, their biggest holiday celebrates the birth of their savior. Hinduism, our biggest holiday celebrates good over evil, right? Uh, and, and for me, I think that, you know, that has been instilled in me from the beginning. And, and politics is exactly that, right? It is good over evil. And so, you know, when people say, well, how did, you know, Hinduism affect you? Uh, I would say it, you know, it taught me good over evil. And that is what, you know, we and, and each of our own rights as elected officials, you know, fight for every day. Um, as far as my parents, uh, they still want me to go to medical school. <laughs> Um, so uh, perhaps one day I will be a success in their eyes. Uh, but I will say, so I as a uh, conniving politician learned very early on in life that when uh, I was in the media, um, I could send it to my parents and they would then send it to all my aunts and uncles and cousins to, to brag because, you know, that's what we do. Um, so uh, very early on, we really pressed India abroad because I knew if I got in India abroad, my parents would accept it, right? <laughs> so in 2015, when I first got elected, I got on the cover of India abroad and it's been smooth sailing since. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so Padma, I, I turn this question to you as well. Uh, you also made history. So Neeraj not only made history as being the youngest uh, representative, but I believe the second Indian American and the first Indian American Republican. Um, so Padma, you also uh, made Michigan history in being uh, the first Hindu American um, to serve in the House. You come from a strong interfaith uh, background, and that was kind of where your roots lie. Um, you were also my former boss as a board member of the Hindu American <laughs> Foundation. Um, share with us, um, you know, what have, has this past year been like um, in office for you? I would say thank you, Suhag, and thank you to the organizers of um, Threads. I just want to also acknowledge someone who is not here with us today, um, Abhay Astanaji, um, for the mentorship that he has provided um, for me along my journey. And yes, we met when I was doing an interfaith panel for um, the HMEC. Um, but the last year is sort of a culmination of everything I've done from childhood, actually. My parents came here when I was, before I even started kindergarten for higher education. We lived here for 11 years, and you can tell that from my accent. But then we went back when I was 15, and so I had to learn how to be an Indian an American in India, right? Because I was already very steeped in what it means to be American. And so I finished my bachelor's in mechanical engineering because my mom always told me, America wants doctors and engineers, and I can't stand the sight of blood. <laughs> I love math. And so here I am, a mechanical engineer back in the United States. My uh, <coughs> husband is also an engineer. We moved to Michigan. And so I started serving the community because that's what my parents did. That was the reason that they went to India. And so the 20 plus years that I've lived in Michigan, I've been volunteering, and volunteering is the ultimate exercise in democracy. And so now I'm, I went from being the public Hindu in interfaith to being the public servant that I've always been, but in an elected capacity. And so that it's been very rewarding, but also um, just entering a new arena. It's like when you start a new job, it takes time to get to learn what you're doing. And so I'm finding that same newness. Um, in this new position. Thank you. 
So now we're, we've talked a little bit about um, public service, and I want to shift a little bit to advocacy and ask kind of the same sort of question um, to uh, Jay and Vindya, and I'll come back to you, um, Senator Eldridge, as well. But Jay, um, you know, you were with the Hindu American Foundation for almost a decade. Um, what was what was your inspiration to join? And, and I'll ask you this question as well, uh, because uh, careers in the public sector are not common. Uh, they're also not necessarily lucrative. So as good in Indian parents do, they worry. <laughs> so what has um, the response of your family also been in terms of choosing kind of a non-traditional path? So I'll start with the, the uh, second question first. Uh, my parents thought I was crazy, and they still do in many ways because I have now left that position. So they're wondering what I'm really up to. These Go to days. medical school, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was it was a very tenuous conversation that I had with my parents uh, at that time, and over time they have accepted that I am not a conventional. Uh, I don't have a conventional career, and I most probably never will. And that's just the personality. All of us have different personalities, and we should accept that, just as there are different uh, strands of, of the Varna uh, Jati system in order to achieve uh, economic viability. We have to accept that as well, that there are different strands of, of uh, careers in our society globally now that we have to engage in in order to uh, to achieve the same goal which is you know just feeding ourselves and putting a roof over our head etc i chose this path because i felt that it was the most uh it was the path that provided me the most satisfaction that i was able to contribute something directly to my community uh, and directly to the story of our community and i'll tell you what inspired me i actually learned about haf uh, I think in 2007, and I was interning at the governor of Texas's office, then Rick Perry. And I was working in a specific office that dealt with international relations of the state. Texas, obviously, a big state, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, international business and, and companies are there. And the sta city of Houston has almost every consulate uh, from every country in the world. And I remember this file folder. Uh, we, we, you know, not everything was digital in 2007, so they were still keeping paper files. And every country had a file in this folder system. And uh, I remember looking at the India file, and it was really small, like really small. And then I looked at the Pakistan folder, and it was huge. It was like this thick, like, and these, this folder is filled with correspondence. And I'll tell you. In that folder, the subfolder that was the largest was of from the Aga Khan community because their, their leader, I guess, is a Pakistani citizen. Uh, and, uh, but, or, and their, most of their community are Pakistani Americans. And so I remember thinking to myself, who's doing correspondence on behalf of the Hindu American community to, mm -hmm. to the governor and to other elected officials? And then I learned about HAF. And to be very honest, I thought to myself, I was going to work for HAF from that day on. And it was because I was working in a public, I was working you know, for the governor of Texas, and I was wondering who is going to be our voice. And we have one, uh, and that is the Hindu American Foundation. Thank you, Jay. So uh, turning to you, Vindhya, um, you were pursuing probably a lucrative legal career and then you switched gears and now are working for the largest refugee resettlement um, agency. So what inspired you to make that shift? And also, what was your parents' reaction? <laughs> Namaste, everyone. Um, before I begin, I just want to thank Suhag for having me on this panel and also my heartfelt thanks to uh, JG Abhay. Abhay Uncle um, Sanjay uh, G for having us all here and for giving me this opportunity. So just like Jay, I'm gonna actually start with the second question first. Um, 
my parents also wanted me to become a doctor. And <laughs> I'm the oldest of two siblings, so my younger brother is a third-year medical student, so they're, they're very happy now. Um, <laughs> but when I was in high school, so I, I actually would say that my public interest career and my civic engagement is what inspired me to become a more dedicated Hindu and embrace my Hindu identity. So it's actually happened in a reverse way for me. Um, but starting with the second question, I was on the science path. I was accepted into biomedical engineering programs for undergrad. I realized it wasn't for me, and then I switched my major to business in undergrad itself and then went to law school straight after. Um, and initially, my parents were also um, a little worried and scared. We don't really have any attorneys in our family. Um, and back then, I think we just had very low numbers of South Asians in general going into the law. Um, but now everything has worked out. Um, so in terms of what inspired me to go into public service, um, well, from the, from the time I was a, a teenager, I knew I wanted to be an attorney because I felt like lawyers really had um, versatility and power in society to affect public opinion and to work on causes and issues um, that, are, that are affecting us at all levels and all generations and in all countries. Um, so I made my decision then to become an attorney. And I was, I was very drawn to civic engagement and, and human rights and public service because I just felt like we're here on this earth for a very short time. It's important for us to give back in a specific you know, way that means the most to us. And that's really just kind of the rudimentary idea I had. Um, I should note that as a teenager into my early 20s, I was actually very confused about my spiritual identity. Um, and I grew up quite insecure to call myself a Hindu. As I started to explore my spiritual path and, and delve more into Hinduism to realize what it's really about, alongside pursuing my legal career, that's really when certain principles and values in Hinduism clicked with me personally. So I'll, I'll talk about two specific principles and how they tie to my career now in public service. Um, when I was 22, I was working for the UN in Tanzania in law school at the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And I saw, I worked on a genocide case. Um, I went to Rwanda, I saw genocide memorials. And I was really heartbroken at that point. Um, I felt like a, a, a huge bubble for me had popped. And I saw firsthand kind of the type of destruction that human beings are capable of inflicting. I remember that night I spoke to my brother who, albeit being younger than me, is actually one of my greatest mentors and gurus. And he said to me at that point, just do your dharma. You have to keep one foot in this world and one foot out of it. You have to be detached and attached at the same time, but you can't really lose yourself in this work. And seeing how much that principle, the principle of dharma and detachment, how much it actually relates to public service and suffering, and how well it allows us to contextualize what is happening in the world today, I think that pulled me closer to Hinduism and away from my insecurity that I had faced as a teenager. Fast forward a couple of years now, and I work for a Jewish resettlement agency where we help everyone all over the world, from Central Americans to South Americans to Muslim refugees from Iraq and Syria. And the principle of Vasudeva Kutumbakam has really clicked with me here. For me personally, as a social justice attorney and as someone who is civically engaged, Vasudeva Kutumbakam means standing in solidarity with people from all over the world and having a true sense of global community and egalitarianism. I am just so in awe of how Hinduism sees the entire world as one community. In a world today where we live in silos and we think, well, that isn't affecting my tribe, that isn't affecting my people, that isn't affecting my caste, it is so refreshing to come from a faith identity that really sees every community's problems as every community's problems. And so hand in hand with my career, I've been able to deepen my love and my understanding of my dharmic roots. Thank you. 
So, Senator Eldridge, um, do you come from a family um, that ran for office? Was this something new? What inspired you to serve? You've been serving for over a decade now. Yes, yeah, so just for the record, my parents thought I was crazy too. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so I perhaps share that connection with the Hindu American community. Um, but um, I'm, I'm in my, my 17th year as a, as a legislator, so my, including my sixth term as a, as a senator. Um, and I, I really appreciate what, what Vindi has said um, and just sort of comment in my interaction with um, Hindu American constituents of mine is that, um, you know, I'm, I'm, there's one friend in particular who's very involved in, in my hometown um, with uh, getting different public projects approved, fire station schools, um, helping support policies in the town to sort of come together and support one another. And I'm always encouraging her to run for office. And I, I think she probably won't run for office, but, but I think what she has been, which I'm hoping inspires um, under other Hindu Americans of the district is she's She's stepped up and become parts of organizations that are not specifically associated with being Indian or Hindu. So she's a leader now with the League of Women Voters. Um, so she's sort of you know, gone beyond the Indian community in Acton um, and connect with people to work on progress to serve you know, everyone in the community. And so I, it's wonderful to see. And you know, I would just say, given the sort of successes and achievements of the Hindu and American community, you know, community, uh, whether in Massachusetts, across the country, is encouraging more to, to do the same and get involved with boards um, and organizations that are serving, you know, everyone in a community. Um, because I, I just think of how much of a difference um, the community can make if, if that sort of next step could be taken. Wise words. Um, so for this next question, I'll just have you all start with Budla and, and work your way down. Um, but. What challenge have you faced in your work that you didn't anticipate going in, and how did you face it? Um, you know, the fourth graders that come to the Capitol um, from our public schools for their field trip um, are one of the best things about my job. And um, drive, they usually ask me the simple questions, you know, what is the favorite thing about the job? What is the thing you like the least about the job? And I always say one of my biggest challenges is the drive, particularly in Michigan winter um, to Lansing. It can be very daunting. But I will tell you the thing that um, I now see as one of my, my biggest challenges is to fulfill um, the role that, that I have now as an ambassador as these young children come in, um, we have one painting in the entire uh, the capital of the, <coughs> the, the state capital, and that is of the governor, uh, Jennifer Granholm, of a woman who has been governor. And so um, a, a little girl asked, um, you know, can a woman be governor? And so, you know, just the fact that women have not been in leadership. And my role as a... Um, as a legislator and what that means since I look different from everyone else who has preceded me as the first Indian American woman and there's a little girl that came on a field trip and she was really bouncy, she was just very active, um, touching things and I take them onto the state, uh, the chambers of the house floor because I can do that when we're not in session and the teacher kept on reprimanding her and telling her to keep her hands to herself and not to ask too many questions. And then at the end of her trip, um, as, as we took a picture, group picture with everybody and then they were leaving, she reaches into her backpack and pulls out a little book and she says, Representative Koopa, can you give me your autograph? <laughs> and I realized how important my role is and what, what um, it almost scares me to think what I have to do to live up to this because it's this little girl. She looks like me, you know, my mom used to send me with oil in my hair and two braids and a little bindi. And, and she looks up at me and, and it just her reality just changed because I'm there. And so some days, even when I don't want to drive all the way to Lansing and deal with some of the politics and the polarization that exists, um, I remember that this is something that I can continue to do by, by being a representative, by being an elected leader. I've changed what leadership looks like. And so staying true to that and, and being the best of who I am um, in that position, following my dharma. Thanks. Jay? So I would say.
I would say the biggest challenge, I think, collectively, we all face at HAF, and Suhag probably still faces it on a daily basis, is just the sheer volume of correspondence that comes from us from the Hindu American community to solve you know, issues related to immigration or workplace discrimination. And I feel that as a community that is fairly sizable in numbers, I mean, we're you know, three to four million in the United States, it is very difficult if our institutions are not properly staffed and given the resources they need in order to succeed. And therefore, it is incumbent upon all of us in these rooms to not only support the Hindu mandirs, uh, the temples in our, in our localities, but to also support advocacy groups who can be the voice of our communities uh, and professionally address the concerns, whether they be workplace discrimination, hate crimes, um, human rights issues abroad, or a number of <coughs> things that impact Hindus on a daily <coughs> basis and impact the d lives of us. And I feel that's where uh, that was the biggest challenge is because you, you, you feel obligated to address everything, and frankly, we can't. Uh, I, we, this, this was a career for me, and therefore, at some point in time, I had to have a personal life, and I had to engage in other things, and, and so therefore, uh, you know, at some point, you have to stop checking your emails, and you have to stop worrying about whether something gets done or not, because at the end of the day, you do have to, as Vindya said, you have to be somewhat detached from this in order to be able to work the next day and to continue doing it as a career. So it... Um, I would, I would say that's the biggest challenge that I've remembered. Thanks, Jay. I would say the biggest challenge is, as an elected official is just the uh, continuous outreach to you know, all different communities or, or stakeholders on, on multiple issues and just how much you have to do that outreach to gain trust and sort of connecting um, on a particular issue or a particular community. So. I'd like to think that you know part of the reason I was invited to the conference today is that I have done a lot of outreach to the South Asian community um, because I understood that to some extent because um, I'm not I'm not Hindu I'm not Indian there there was initial sense of you know perhaps lack of trust and so going to all those different community events gathering that trust um, so that now I'm able to work uh, with members of the Hindu American community on different issues that they might care deeply about. Um, and then beyond sort of different immigrant communities, just working with different stakeholders on issues. I do a lot of work around climate change and uh, Massachusetts in some ways has been a leader on that issue, um, but um, there are so many different organizations, so many different perspectives about how do we tackle climate change from a state perspective and just continuously going out to all these different groups and meeting with individuals and it really is, you know, just eternally happening as an elected official. The, the legislature in Massachusetts is a, what's known as a full-time legislature, so you know my schedule is six or seven days a week. I have a full schedule today and tomorrow. Um, but you really need to do that in order to gain the trust in connecting with a wide variety of people to actually make progress on issues. And I absolutely love the job, but it's certainly something, a reminder that unless you're continuously making those contacts and making new contacts, especially in a state in Massachusetts, where 25% of the residents are foreign born, um, unless you're doing that, you're really not connecting in a way to make true sort of transfor transformational progress. Thank you, Niraj. I'm actually gonna flip the question, if that's okay. I'm gonna talk Absolutely. about something that I thought was going to be my biggest challenge that, that wasn't. So my biggest challenge is and has been and continues to be my age. Uh, people in politics, love young people until young people actually try to do something. Um, so five years ago when I was first running, um, you know, my team and I, we sat down and we said, okay, well, what's our biggest challenge going to be? Um, and we thought it was going to be my Hinduism, right? Uh, my district, I am the only Hindu Republican elected official in the country. I'm it. I'm all you got, Okay. Um, and so my district is, as Dr. Kunna here knows, is 95% white, is 95% Christian. There are zero synagogues and zero temples in my district and 126 churches, right? So uh, we thought it was going to be 
uh, my Hinduism, my and 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 frankly my being Indian, um, and it, it really has not been, um, which you know to me has has been you know a sigh of relief. Um, you know we thought we were going to come under attack and face questions and face uh, you know all of these different things about you know my ethnicity and about uh, my religion, but. Um, you know, I don't pretend to speak for the other party, but as a Republican, what we have found uh, is that, you know, Republicans care about your positions. And so long as you vote with your conservative values, um, they're for you. There have been a few instances where we've gotten questions of, you know, hey, what is your religion? Uh, and then when you say that you're Hindu and, and not Muslim, when you say you're Hindu and, and Indian, you know, they ask about what good Indian restaurant they should go to. Um, but it, it ends up being okay. Now, you know, and, and I, I speak often at, at HAF events, and I, I do talk about a potential future challenge, which is that people generally don't know what Hinduism is, right? And so, um, you know, they have a neutral opinion. That's why when I say I'm Hindu, they, they say, okay, they shrug their shoulders and, and we move on. Um, but, you know, the tie can turn easily against us, right? Uh, and so, you know, we have to be, I think, very vigilant uh, in that, right? You know, we, I know that, you know, HAF did a lot of work against this Reza Islam, you know, documentary or hit piece, as I call it, on CNN a couple years ago. And, and things like that in popular culture uh, can turn very quickly uh, against our community. And so, um, you know, that I think could be my future biggest challenge. But because of, you know, VHPA and HAF and a lot of different organizations, I think that, you know, we are, we are working, uh, you know, every day on that. Thank you. India. Yeah, so I think I can talk about the challenges I faced in two um, major departments of my life. So first, my actual professional legal career, and then in the second bucket, through my advocacy work that I've done for the Hindu American, Indian American community. First off, as a, as a female woman of color, Hindu American attorney, um, I don't think that my struggles are necessarily uh, rare. I think a lot of things I've seen and faced are pretty emblematic <coughs> of what a lot of women go through in the legal profession period. And one thing, one concept that I've really thought about which has caused me to delve deeper into my Hindu beliefs and, and question you know, what I stand for is this idea of internalized uh, misogyny that we see in a lot of corporate workplaces, and I don't think the nonprofit and social justice sector is necessarily less susceptible to this. I can give you an example. So a uh, unnamed colleague of mine a, a few years ago, or a couple of, actually a couple of months ago, um, told me as a woman, um, we shouldn't wear bright colors in the workplace. It's going to reduce our chances of getting a promotion. And I thought about this very deeply, right? I come from a religion and a culture that is beautifully vibrant, that is beautifully colorful. I've grown up with festivals like Holi and Diwali, wearing beautiful Indian dresses that my aunts have gotten stitched for me from Andhra Pradesh, where my parents are from, and other parts of India. And somehow this just didn't make sense to me because something as personal as dress and appearance should never be subsumed under an image or concept of what somebody else thinks, right? So in my small act of personal defiance, I decided to come to work wearing a bright orange scarf that I bought from Varanasi and I had it over my business suit. And that's when it really hit me. And, and everyone complimented it. Nobody really thought it was weird or anything. And that's when I realized I don't need to subsume, you know, my sense of identity or dress or appearance under a Western imperialistic notion of how women ought to behave or talk or dress in the workplace. Um, and this is something I've, I've, I've been thinking about um, a lot lately as well. I would say another challenge I face in the professional realm is just sheer unfamiliarity, right? So I work for an organization built on Jew Jewish values, um, which are beautiful, and there's so many commonalities between Judaism and Hinduism. But 
there is also this sense of um, exoticizing Eastern faiths and Eastern culture. And some questions, albeit well-intentioned, can come off as ignorant. So the way I've tried to combat this is just using any opportunity as much as possible to educate my colleagues, my stakeholders, and my peers about really what I practice and what I believe in. Most recently, um, and I was really happy to do this, October 27th commemorated the one-year anniversary of the horrific uh, shooting and tragedy that happened in Pittsburgh last year at a synagogue in which, you know, Hyas was directly named and implicated. And I was asked to give a few words um, in memory of the victims, and I tied my words to Hindu Dharma, to the concept of universal compassion, family, and solidarity. And I really saw that small chance, that small moment as a way to connect with some of my Jewish and Christian brothers and sisters and, and eliminate some of the barriers we face. I'll say to the last piece, um, another challenge I faced, and this time now in my advocacy and, and community engagement work is really, really around mobilizing Hindu American youth. Um, and fortunately, and I know this because I dealt with this personally, we have really been victims of an apologist attitude, you know, constantly having to defend our practices or explain them, um, at times being made to feel ashamed or guilty of being Hindu or practicing in a certain way. I'm very passionate about young people, and sometimes when I go to different events and when I tr want to try to bring more college students and, and high schoolers into the fold, um, I deal a lot with, with, um, with kids who, who feel insecure, who feel afraid to identify themselves as Hindu, or who feel afraid in light of the kind of the socio-political context we see now and buzzwords like Hindu nationalism and Hindutva that are being thrown around. And really, um, what, what I want to do and what I hope to do in the future is just to continue to educate, uh, work, work in solidarity with peers and organizations to educate our youth, help them realize what a beautiful culture they come from, and help them realize that being American and Hindu are not mutually exclusive. And in fact, they're very intimately tied together, and you can have a career in advocacy, practicing your Eastern religion, and also being in a Western world. Thank you. So um, we have about 13 minutes left, at least, of our formal uh, comments. If you have questions, I encourage you to write them down, and um, someone will bring them to me, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. I am um, going to give you a question that I did not email any of you uh -oh. ahead of time, uh, <laughs> because I just like to roll that way. Um, but, you know, last week, we, or maybe it was maybe 10 days ago, the, the biggest thing I think that's been in the news um, is Kashmir and the abrogation of Articles 370 and 35A. And um, many of you may be familiar, but there was a hearing um, at the House Foreign Affairs Committee, subcommittee on uh, South Asia. And I think that there's probably consensus, at least in this room, that we saw maybe an erosion of the fact-finding process. And it's not just there, but in many other realms that we're seeing partisanship erode public trust, whether it's the media, whether it's our uh, governmental institutions. Um, do you see this in your various um, spheres? Do you see this? and? What are you able to do about it? Um, I'll start in the middle. So, Senator Elder. <laughs> in, in, and I'm sorry, an erosion of? Public trust. Public trust. Um, well, I think that certainly in, in, in some respects, um, in, in, in Massachusetts, in, in some ways, the um, Massachusetts legislature, which um, those of you are from Massachusetts probably know it's a very democratic state, but generally most uh, legislation that passes in Massachusetts is, is fairly bipartisan. There's not too many Republican elected officials, but um, most <coughs> legislation passes in a bipartisan manner. Um, but what I, what I have seen in the, in the Republican Party is that um, the, the Massachusetts Republican Party has really um, shifted 
very far to, to the right, um, such that the, the governor of Massachusetts, Governor Charlie Baker, who's more of a moderate Democrat, has essentially um, created a separate entity to, to support more moderate um, Republicans. And um, unfortunately, what I've seen is that the, the Massachusetts Republican Party you know, is putting out you know, mailings that I think are, are, are fairly inaccurate, um, not only directed at Democrats, but at, at uh, moderate Republicans. So, um, so I, I certainly think there's been some erosion on that side. Um, I think on the, on the Democratic side, and I'm, I'm uh, I guess, categorized as a progressive Democrat, there's certainly um, those on, on the left that I think have, have also um, engaged in a lot of attacks if someone doesn't have a, a pure record on certain issues. So I think I've seen that as well. And as far as the, the media, and this is, you know, obviously not just the Massachusetts phenomenon, is, and it's, it's really sad to see, it's just that local media has really gone away. So, you know, in the district I represent, there once, once were approximately 25 weekly papers. Um, now there's about 10 weekly papers, and most of them are owned by multinational corporations. So there's not a lot of local content. And so, you know, the question that a lot of us are asking in the legislature is, you know, who is going to cover, you know, the, the work we're doing and, and make sure that, you know, quite honestly, as elected officials, we're held accountable. Um, and so that's certainly going away. And what, what can be done to, to, to replace that or suppl supplant that, whether it's, you know, blogs or, or local media and, and how to, you know, how do people get, you know, perhaps compensated to do that kind of work to cover what's going on in the media. And therefore, what's going on at the state house is, is, is much less covered. There was a, a time when I started out the legislature, there were approximately 10 daily papers, each of whom had a reporter assigned to the state house. Now it's really just, you know, the Boston Globe and, you know, maybe one other p publication. So, so in that sense, I think that's eroded, and I'm not sure what's, what's going to replace that. Thank you. Um, Neeraj. So I'll, I'll talk about partisanship and then, and then public trust and then on, on Kashmir. Um, you know, I'll make a defense of partisanship. Uh, partisanship exists because there are real differences. People have real disagreements. Right? If we talk about you know, foreign policy, there are Americans who support Pakistan, and there are Americans who support India. Why would we tell them to say, well, abandon your principles and come together? Partisanship is good. Discourse is good. Disagreement is good. The problem is, is when disagreement becomes disagreeable. right? And in the media and in Congress, it's become what I call a real daytime soap opera, right? Uh, it is no longer about discourse on real issues. Uh, it is uh, a soap opera uh, meant to have a political victory, right? Uh, and the national media and the national Congress uh, play right into that. And I think that erodes the public trust. When the public does not see its elected leaders and uh, its fourth estate, the national media, uh, advancing an agenda to do something for the public good, that is when public trust is eroded. Um, on the issue of Kashmir, I know the question wasn't about that, but I will say, um, as a Hindu elected official, uh, it is very frustrating to me. Um, you know, the Indian American and Hindu community have done uh, incredible work in supporting those of us, and I have received a lot of that support, and I am very thankful. But why any Indian or Hindu American would ever support an elected official who has spoken against the revocation of 370 is beyond me, okay? And I'll go a step further. When a member of Congress who looks like us speaks against the revocation of 370, which is effectively effectively saying that what would happen to Kashmiri Pandits is okay. When someone that looks like us does that, that is pro pro probably the worst thing that could happen. Because then a member of Congress who doesn't look like us, when they see someone who looks like us do that, well, they say, well, that must be okay then. If, if a Hindu Indian American member of Congress is against the revocation of 370, is against the government of India's actions, then it must be okay, right? And that is a huge problem, right? 
And, and so, you know, not, not to be partisan, but the, the American left, uh, there is a problem. There is a problem with what I call radical Islam and their influence uh, on the, the American left. And when care, when you have care, and, and you know, HAF will show you their budget versus care's budget, uh, advancing Pakistan's agenda, uh, which is an anti-Hindu agenda, we have a big problem. Uh, and so, you know, I would urge you and urge everyone in your networks to think about who you're supporting and whether they are actually doing things for Hindu Americans. Padma. So I will say, while we want to have our values as a Democrat or as a Republican or as an independent, I think hyper-partisanship causes lack of public trust. And one of the things that my background as a Hindu <coughs> is that there's no one right way. There are many ways to the truth. Ekam sat vipraha bahuda vadanti. And that's what I think is why I won. I'm the first Democrat to ever hold this seat. I'm the first immigrant to ever hold this seat. Um, I'm the second woman. And so the, the reason that the constituents of Troy and Clawson in Michigan gave me their trust is because I didn't believe in this hyperpolarization where, like Neeraj said, where we are disagreeable. But also, I think that things need to be negotiated. And we're seeing where we're unwilling to negotiate. And my experience is sometimes I have to negotiate not only within my own family, but within my own um, self. Because you know there might be a day where there's um, Halloween might fall on Diwali, so which one do I celebrate, <laughs> right? I mean, those simple things um, happen for us. And so um, I think it's really critical that we show that we are able to navigate these spaces as elected officials um, with re to reestablish public trust. Um, as a state representative, um, I also carry a very specific, um, I've been a public Hindu. I've been a board member of the Hindu American Foundation. Locally, I started an interfaith organization, so any question about Hinduism always came to me. I was the public Hindu because every institution I went in wearing a sari with a bindi and, and speaking about being Hindu. So there was never any doubt that I was Hindu. Um, and so people come to me now both to defend the issue of Kashmir and the abrogation of 370 and also to defend the plight of the Muslims um, in, in Kashmir to ensure that human rights is, is not violated. And the thing I will say is if we don't look at the historical context, the, the global community, the national community, the local community has to make sure that they're educated. And that, that is one of the reasons that I ran, is because of education. I think there's really an opportunity for us to educate as Hindu leaders, as Hindu elected officials, what people don't know, that what happened in 88, 89 needs to be talked about to explain where we are today. What happened in 1947 when, when Kashmir chose to be part of India and what has happened to the, the state of Kashmir since, whether it's uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir or 1972 when, when part of Kashmir was, was become, has become part of China. So you have to look at the whole historical context. And so as, as an Indian American with um, a background in, in advocacy through the Hindu American Foundation, I definitely feel I have a unique opportunity to talk about this as a, a much larger issue than just what is happening right now. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come to Vindya and then to you, Jay. Vindya, go ahead. Sure. So I've often thought about this, this issue, erosion of, of trust in the government, polarization, and I can, I can speak about it, I think, within the context of my identity and work um, as someone who's not an elected official but who works for a social justice organization. 
Um, at times, I really have to struggle with fitting my identity and my values and my beliefs within particular situations or silos or contexts that really matter to me. So for instance, I'm a lawyer working for a Jewish liberal progressive organization that really stands by protecting the rights of refugees and asylum seekers and immigrants. And yes, this administration has made our work extremely difficult um, and at times very, very discouraging, um, both from a professional and from sort of a, a mental perspective. Um, and I'm grateful for the support of my colleagues and the work they do in helping us, you know, really fulfilling our mandate and our mission. And as someone who has uh, identified as a lifelong Democrat and as a progressive millennial, so to speak, I also find myself uh, very confused and heartbroken with a lot of with a lot of the Hindu-phobic and alienating language coming out of the Democratic Party. And at times, I really do find myself ideologically confused and sometimes party homeless, not really knowing where to stand. Um, on one side, I do support uh, general, you know, social justice issues, human rights issues, generally, my, I'm, I'm more left of center, but now with the, with the inflammatory rhetoric and Hindu phobic verbiage that's coming out. At times I'm at a loss for words and don't really know where to turn. I've decided that my way of handling this is really to just do what I can in my own capacity to try as much as possible to bring these two identities together and be as inclusive as I can of other people and their disagreements. As an attorney, I greatly cherish the art of argument and nuanced debate. And it seems like we're really losing this art, not just in American society, but really in political circles around the world. We see politics becoming increasingly polarized. You're either a leftist communist or you're an alt-right conservative. And I sort of miss the intellectual nuance in the debate that we really should be valuing as, a, as an enlightened society. One uh, example of how I've tried to fit myself within this di these different identities is um, recently, uh, actually working with Jay, um, I was able to, we were able to, uh, Hayes was able to take on the case of a Bangladeshi Hindu woman who is uh, now applying for asylum. This is, I think in Hayes's history, this may be our first, if not one of the first, um, cases we've taken on of an actual Hindu minority. Um, and so this allows me to serve my community and my people while at the same time really honoring those, those social values I stand by, which is protection for refugees, asylum seekers, and immigrants. Turning to one second on the Kashmir issue, um, there's a lot of polarized talk around this, but I guess one experience I can briefly talk about is I did attend a Stand with Kashmir event with a Kashmiri Pandit friend of mine a couple of months ago, very, very open-hearted and just willing to learn. I honestly don't, didn't know much then about sort of Stand with Kashmir's platform or, um, or their, their uh, speakers or, or materials, but I just wanted to go and learn more about this issue. And what truly horrified me at this event was prominent academicians and members of the intelligentsia and reporters actively denying that targeted killings happened with pundits actively denying that there was an exodus, actively denying genocide. The first step towards reconciliation and healing is to accept that a wrong occurred. When you deny that, you deny someone's very existence and very identity. And that has certainly caused me a